David Williams with Jesus Ministries. So, what happened was Jesus said that my words are spirit and they are life. Jesus told the people of his day that his words were spirit and his words were life. Now, what that essentially is describing is the reality that his words affected reality. His words affected reality. Your words affect reality. And relationships are about an exchanging of or a transferring of power. There are a variety of scriptures in God's Old and New Covenant that explain the importance of right relationships and the danger of bad relationships. And we are always talking about relationships because we are talking about survival and success. This weekend we were talking about false prophets. What makes a person a false prophet? Well, a false prophet is someone who has the wrong message, the wrong method, the wrong mission, and the wrong or the wrong source of information. You could have the right source of information and the wrong method and that make you a false prophet. You can have the right source of information, the right method, but the wrong motive and that could make you a false prophet. You could so being a true man of God, a faithful woman of God describes you being connected to God according to his will. It describes you getting the pattern for what you do from God. It describes having the right motive behind what it is that you are doing. It describes understanding your responsibilities. And because you sit in the presence of God and you submit to the word of God, you are able to do exactly what the Lord wants you to do. So people who are not surrendered or not submissive to God's word are in jeopardy of being rejected, classified by Almighty God as a false prophet. Jesus is warning us about false prophets. He's telling us that as we get closer to his return, that the influences are going to get worse. He's saying that false prophecy is going to become more prevalent. He is saying that confusion and delusion is going to be more active. We've had people testify of interacting with men, women, and children who are bringing teaching that contradicts God's word, but yet the teaching is still coming. The communication is still being made, being had. The, 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 the words are still being transferred. So we are inundated with communication and most of the sources are not from Father God. So what happens when most of what you are hearing is coming from a source other than Father God? What happens? And what happens when you are designed to accept these sources that are not God's voice? What happens when you have an appetite for the communication that comes from a foreign source, a strange source. We have, we have to evaluate that. What does it mean when I enjoy communication that doesn't come from Father God? What does that identify about me? What, what is God indicating when I can open my ears to a source that 
is not the voice of God. Not realizing, not recognizing the crucial time in, in, in which we're living. The word of God says that the sons of Issachar were men of understanding, men who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. We've got many ministers, many pastors, many speakers, and they are communicating. They are setting up platforms for communication. They're governing uh, assemblies and, 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 and building uh, great works uh, supposedly for the kingdom of God, but we are in danger of masking the main issue, which is the fact that man doesn't think like God, doesn't agree with God, and needs to change. Uh, and change is not necessarily or simply about addition. It's also about subtraction. So the Spirit of God wants to wipe away the old personality, the old appetites, and he wants to add the right things. Many people are under the impression that God wants to bless them. They are not under the impression, though, that God wants to purify them. You could, you, you could recognize the fact that that God wants to bless you, but do you recognize the fact that God wants to separate you from things that discredit his holy nature? So God is love, God is righteous, God is just, God is pure. So, so God has a, a nature that he exhibits, that he communicates. There's a righteousness to God. Many people are accepting uh, the, the salvation message, the blessing message, the success message, the promises of God without understanding that there needs to be pure genuine, sincere, continuous repentance from dead works, ungodly thinking, ungodly emotions, ungodly desires. And we're not submissive to allow God to identify for us what continually, what that looks like. So relationships are a basis for influence, which, which, which means, and influence means control. So the Lord, so the people that we surround ourselves with, the people we subject ourselves to, we are giving them control. And even if you say that you are in control in these relationships, your attraction to these people is identifying you, your attraction to these places, the fact that you want to be in these settings and that you want to be around these people and you want to hear this information that identifies you. So you could say to yourself of yourself that you are a follower of Jesus, yet you want to subject yourself to people who don't talk about Jesus and their beliefs differ from things Jesus says. Jesus says this, you are saying that. Or Jesus says this, you in one sense state your agreement with Jesus, but yet you associate with those who say things and do things that Jesus did not say or told us not to say. Jesus did not do or told us not to do. You enjoy that company. You enjoy that influence. You enjoy you enjoy those settings. You enjoy that source. Yet you say that you enjoy Jesus. And the Lord God is a jealous God. And what that means is that he angrily protects 
those that he identifies as his own. He is jealous. He does not desire to have his children, his people interact with sources that are that are that are against him. So Jesus said in Matthew 12, he that is not with me is against me. That that's a very exclusive statement, a very definitive position to take in the world. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. He that doesn't bring to me scatters abroad. And he's concerned with that. Jesus is deeply concerned with the impact that people and places are having on our lives, on our thinking, on our emotions. The Lord is greatly concerned with the impact that people are having on us and places are having on us. We are not our own. We've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And since we're made in his image, he requires that we do what he says. And if we don't do what he says, then he's going to reject us. There are beliefs that tell us that that's not true. God doesn't reject people. God doesn't. And all of these ideas and beliefs contradict the Jesus described in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Revelation. If you just simply discover the Jesus talked about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Revelation, you'd find a Jesus that is absolutely committed to holiness and truth and love. And when you love someone, you protect them. When you love someone, you want to 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 isolate them from from that which would ruin their lives. When you love someone, you want to ensure their development. When you love someone, you want to devote affection to them. You 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 want to please them and God knows what you can take what you can handle what what makes you stronger what makes you better God is completely aware of that he made you the maker made you he knows you he created you and he doesn't want you to be damaged by your relationships or by the places that you might enjoy going uh, by the things you might enjoy listening to, by the things you might enjoy watching. It, it doesn't matter that you enjoy things or that you have a desire to hear things. The real question is, what did God, what does God require? What did God mandate? There are people who ignore the word of God because they, they, they feel like their perspectives of God's word are adequate. No, I already know what the Bible says, and I, I've studied it. Well, meditating on what it says day and night better equips us to understand in real time with great frequency what the Holy Spirit is actually saying moment by moment. That's what Psalm 1 teaches us. That's what Jesus is preaching in John 15. Abiding. There's an abiding because the spirit of error, antichrist, and false prophecy is more active among the so-called Christian, among the so-called believer in Jesus, in the, in the churches, in the churches. Before we get to that place where God judges America for its idolatry, we are looking at a church that is very idolatrous. We are looking at a church where witchcraft is prevalent, rebellion is prevalent, lasciviousness and perversion is overlooked. That's what we're looking at. Jesus is warning us about what he calls the lukewarm church. They're not too hot, meaning they're not passionate as they ought to be, yet they're not too cold. They're not as raunchy. They're not as 
evil as they could be. So, so the church is not a gay club, but yet it's also not a place where the Holy Ghost is active. It's in the middle. It, it, it accepts some of the good and some of the, some of the wretched. It just, it just vacillates. It just combines it. It's a combination of the pure and the profane. And we know that that is what is happening. We are in these settings where we don't even know. Uh, I mean, and the danger is that when you are around people who are supposed to be faithful to God and they're setting a bad example for you, it is easy to adopt what they do and to believe that that's the standard. It's easy to believe that what you are around is the standard. Yeah, well, I'm around these people, and that's a pastor, that's an evangelist, this person's a deacon, and that's really upsetting God. God has revealed that the leadership in our country, the leadership in our churches, they are the ones responsible for what we say and do. In some great sense, our parents, our presidents, our pastors, as, as, especially the pastors, the ministers, those who profess to know God, who seem to spend more time reading his word, who seem to spend more time in prayer. They, 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 because we know that God promotes people. We know that God elevates people and, and that he might distinguish this one. Uh, above that one. We understand that. We understand that. So we know that God sets up leadership. And, but the real question you have to ask is, is this a good leader or a bad leader? And the Holy Ghost gives us standards by which to judge that. And we are under the impression, for some of us, that we are not required to examine or to evaluate the people or the information that we are hearing. But the Lord told the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, he said, you have tried those who have said that they are apostles but were not, and you found them to be liars. Nowadays, you can go through the weakest processes in order to gain a title, a certificate, a degree, it's now, if you want to get a degree in engineering or some medical field, in one of the medical fields, those are more difficult to acquire. These professions that are not focused on the spiritual world or eternal life, they're focused on the mechanical world, the physical world, the material world. Yeah, th th their standards are higher than in the churches. In the churches. The churches have very low standards because the churches that are not governed by the Holy Spirit or the Word of God are going to run their churches like the mechanic runs his mechanic shop, like the hospital runs the, 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 their, their medical responsibilities, like law, law enforcement. And so the same standards that we are seeing in the secular world are... Are, are, are being exercised or attempting or exercised in the churches. Okay, so now that might seem like the exact opposite of what I just said, but we need to respect this. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. The world has a way of preparing and uh, of preparing its leaders and establishing its leaders. And they have a basis by which they judge or hold its leaders accountable. The kingdom of God works very differently. So Jesus' development of disciples looks very different. And the people he sets over the church, look, that process is very different than, than the process of becoming a secular teacher in the, in the academic world in the school system in the public school system or in the private school system it looks very different than becoming a physician it looks very different than becoming a mechanic uh, 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 you know it looks very very different than becoming uh, a custodian or 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 a, a lawyer or anything so the process 
of having a person acquire this information by way of textbooks and a teacher. Now this is all the physical world, the material world. This guy is going to talk about early child care and this lady is going to teach on um, I don't know, cosmetology, and the student is going to sit there, their brains are going to absorb that information, this guy is going to absorb this information, he wants to be a dentist, so he goes to school, and the teacher is saying these natural or physical principles and describing these laws, this person is a physical person, though he has a spirit, he primarily thinks of, th of things in a physical way. And he's listening to this teacher, he's listening to that instructor, she's listening to that educator. This person's submitting to the information of this tutor. And we are both spiritual and physical people. And so physical mind is hearing this information, processing it, and either it can perform these duties or it can't perform these duties, but it's still all physical. This guy is listening to that person, he's listening to him, she's listening to her, and as the information is coming in, the person is storing it, and then they are required to apply it to, the commer to, to commerce, to economics, to politics, to social uh, responsibilities. Yes, we are physical people, we're taught, fi we're taught information, our physical brains process it, our minds process it and then we attempt to apply it in order to see development and productivity but as it relates to the things of the Spirit of God in order to operate faithfully as a minister of God the standards are different the, the, the methods of teaching differ and essentially in the physical world learning physical in information and then applying it greatly differs from the power of the Holy Spirit because you can subject yourself to information and the Holy Spirit not fill you. You can sit there, read a book, you can study this information, listen to it, you can write essays and all kinds of dissertations and hear all kinds of lectures, but that does not mean God is speaking to you. That doesn't mean he's transforming you. And now we live in a very polluted society. And many of the people who have once been transformed have gone back out into the ungodly world, meaning they've begun to take in ungodly information as they take in righteous information. So even for those who are hearing from God, many of them have not separated themselves from the communication of their society, which causes the bathtub to be full of water and of motor oil. So you want to take a bath, you want to bathe, there's some extravagant event you've been invited to, you're preparing for it, and so you want to bathe prior to going and you fill the bathtub with, with, with oil of Olay, uh, liquid soap and hot water and mobile 10 WD I forget what it's motor oil motor oil motor oil oil of Olay hot water and you put a quart of that mo motor oil in the bathtub a quart of you know uh, the thing of oil of Olay and that's what you want to bathe in you want to bathe in motor oil and in oil of Olay and in hot water yeah, so, so many of us are absolutely doing that. We have a complete inability to discern what we should be taking in from what we ought not be taking in. But when you are around that hypocrisy, that double-mindedness, that lukewarmness, it is easy to adopt it, to pick it up, take it on, be that way. Yes, it's easy to be that way because you're around that. So when you are around lukewarmness, you're around hypocrisy, it's easy to operate as a hypocrite. 
It's easy to operate in a lukewarm way. It's easy to serve two masters or to attempt to serve two masters. It's easy to hear the words of Jesus and the words of the secular uh, people of influence, the ungodly, because you are around a compromising people. You would love God, but yet you're around these people and they say all kinds of things. They don't hold themselves accountable to the word of God. No, they do essentially whatever they want to do. And because they do what they want to do and yet profess Christ and you don't separate yourself from them or the things they say, you are affected because you are built to be affected by the people around you, which is why you are commanded not to be around people who profess to know God, yet who deny him in their works. So if the Lord says, hey, listen, come out from among them and be separate and don't touch the unclean thing, that's a basis for whether I, God, receive you or whether I reject you. Let me read something to you very, very Important. That's very important. This is 2 Corinthians 6, 14. It says this, Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's a matter of influence. God is saying, don't position yourself to be influenced by information or by people who are saying things that are ungodly or that don't surrender to the standards Jesus is setting. If you are listening to this and the standards by which it's communicating reality don't match up to what Jesus said, then it's going to erode and to attack your faith because faith is spiritual awareness that God gives you that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So God tells man that he exists and God tells man that he that he rewards those who diligently who committedly who dedicatingly dedicatedly seek him so God will reward you he will do miraculous things in your life he will work with your world he'll enable you to have control in your world and there are people who are experiencing the goodness of God, and yet they are also carrying the mentalities of the ungodly. So the word of God says that frequently. This is a people who come near to me with their lips and they honor me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine, the standards, the commands, the instructions of fallen men. So when the Lord says don't be unequally connected with unbelievers, he is telling us that there are people who believe as they ought to and there are people who don't believe as they ought to and your relationship with them ought not be such that they impact your responsibilities because God's going to judge you by whether you are doing what he's told you to do or whether you are not. And because the church is so infected with hypocrisy and lukewarmness, we can't tell who's who and what's what. It's not that nobody can tell. It's not that you guys who are hearing this can't tell that what you're hearing is true. It's just that when you love the world so much, your appetite for truth greatly diminishes. Jesus said, no man who desires old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. If we look at this wine from the perspective of information or knowledge, well, if you're used to old knowledge, if you're used to lustful knowledge, proud knowledge, uh, rebellious knowledge, presumptuous knowledge, if you're used to this vain entertainment and vain professed religious people, then when you hear the truth, your appetite for that will be limited. You, you, you won't be able to stomach it. You won't be able to enjoy it or to believe it because you've been around so much vanity and, and emptiness. But So when you hear the truth, it just rubs you the wrong way because you've accepted your, your, your way as 
right. Like, no, I'm right. Like, I am right. This is right. This is okay. It's okay that it's like this. It's okay that I'm like this. It's okay that he's like that. It's okay that this is here. And we have filled our environment with bad communication. The word of God says evil communication corrupts good manners. Many people don't realize that what they hear affects who they are or what they expose themselves to identify them. If I expose myself to this, God will treat me according to what I expose myself to because being willing to see this, being willing to hear this communicates what I like what I want, what I accept as true. I remember when I was in a store, this was 2008, and there was this vampire movie series that was initially a book that was being produced. And it was becoming very popular. And I wondered what made it so popular. I said to myself, what makes this so popular and so attractive to people? It's clearly dark. It's clearly evil. What's so attractive about it? And so this was probably about maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. I was in a, a city south of where I live. And as I was in the Walmart, Walmart had a very large, Walmart had at that time, 11 years ago, a very large display where they were selling these materials from this vampire movie series. And I said to myself, I'm going to evaluate this. I want to see what makes it so alluring and attractive to the masses. And so I sat there and I began to read some of the information that they had displayed about the, the series. And as I'm there reading it, I wasn't listening to the music playing. It was, again, about maybe 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. And the store wasn't very busy. It wasn't full of people. So you could hear the music that the store was playing overhead with greater ease. So I'm there. And I'm looking at the information that they had about this series. And as I'm doing that, I hear this... I hear this singing overhead over the PA system and it says something like oh, it's a secular song playing and it said run away run away run away if you want to survive that's what the secular song said I'm standing there attempting to understand what made this so attractive to the people, to the population, to many millions of people. What makes this so attractive? I am a believer in Jesus. I accept Jesus as the King, as the Lord, as the Savior, as the worldwide ruler. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to view this as something that I'd eventually enjoy, but I'd like to know what makes this so interesting to people. So as I'm reading the information, I hear this secular song play over the PA system here at this Walmart. And the secular song, the lady was singing, run away, run away, run away if you want to survive. And when she said that, immediately the Lord used those words to pierce my ungodly, ignorant curiosity and my focus. Hey, you are exposing yourself to that which is infused with demon power. Now that's one of the things that we really ignore consistently. Please understand that most of the people you know ignore the fact that much of what they hear has demon power on it. It's got a spirit on it. It's not just a person talking most of the time. It's not just imagery most of the time. It's it's got power to it. The Word of God says that very plainly in many, many situations. It uses the term curse. Do you understand what that word blessing means? Curse, what it means? When you say this is a blessing, you're saying it came from a spiritual source and it has power to do good, to bring productivity. 
when you say that something is cursed, you're saying that there's a spiritual force on it that brings about destruction, that it does more than it appears to do. It's not just a car, it's a cursed car. So for instance, I was being uh, obedient to the Lord to uh, a healthy degree. It's possible to be faithful at each stage of your growth. So I had a vehicle. The vehicle was an older vehicle. It, it was having certain problems, but nothing too expensive. And I had transmission issues. And, and um, I, 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 I let someone drive the vehicle. And I had zero problems with the, the or zero major problems with this vehicle. I would drive it. I was sensitive to what the vehicle was doing, and I didn't have any problems. I let someone else uh, borrow the vehicle once and maybe twice the second time. Matter of fact, I think it was the first time. No, maybe it's the second time. I let the person borrow the vehicle. I said to the person, hey, uh, be careful with it. The person said, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I'll be careful with something like that. Or you, the person may have made a joke. When the person came back, the vehicle, the person was gone for a maximum of seven minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And then the person came back, the vehicle is smoking. And I'm, like, and I'm like, what just happened? The transmission went bad. It may have been going bad. But when the grace of God is on your life, God will protect you from the calamity from the de degradation, from the ruin of your world, of, 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 of the physical world. So, so it's possible to be, ex to, to be in position to suffer, yet to survive and to succeed in the midst of danger. It's possible to prosper in the midst of chaos, it's possible to prosper using faulty or weak materials. You could have a you could have something that is brittle, but yet because of the blessings of God on your life, it could be very very useful. But then with the curse of God on your life, when you live a life of secret rebellion or open rebellion, or confused, ignorant rebellion, then the Lord talks about throughout the scriptures the curse, how the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. What does it mean when we say a curse is on it? We're saying that that item, that person, that situation has evil attached to it, and there are bad things, there are pain, there are things that are going to cause pain, suffering, and loss that you can't see. There are forces that are going to bring about suffering that are associated with that person, that place, or this series of, this method. If you do it this way, the, the, the effects are going to have a curse attached to it. Uh, or the, the method has a curse attached to it, a curse attached to it. So it'll, it'll cause suffering, it'll cause pain, it'll cause harm and danger. If you do it this way, the blessing of the Lord will be on it. And so I let the person hold the car for a second. And because of a lifestyle of disobedience, the car came back with a $2,000, 2200 repair responsibility. It was very quick. I had the pro I had the car. I wasn't having problems with it. I let this person hold hold it for a short time. I knew the person was having problems. I said to myself, well, God will God is not this upset with that person that 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 um, to the extent that me lending the person my car would cause problems. The car like, lost its transmission. $2300 fixed and I had to fix it because I needed the vehicle uh, there are so when we talk about information we're talking about power and how power is moved from one source to another source from one object to another object and so as I'm in this store and I'm viewing this information I hear this 
music. I know the music is not from the Lord, but the Lord, through this music, got my attention. If you want to survive, you better stop reading what you're reading, and you better run away and get what you came into this store to get and leave. Because this information is not just someone's vain imagination, someone's abuse of cre creativity. No, there are spirits, there are curses attached to these figures, these stories of vampires and, and, and werewolves and evil spirits. I know that they want to mix romance with demon possession, but it's going to bring about suffering because you can't mix the good with the bad. You can't tell stories that generate fear, that generate lust, that generate a desire for false religion, that expose you to to what the devil does with fallen man. The devil likes to brag. The devil likes to brag. He wants to talk about how he's running man's life. The devil likes to talk about how he's controlling man's thoughts. The devil wants to talk about the abuse that he's doing to man. Oh, yeah. Satan wants to talk about all of that. And much of our entertainment is a result of what Satan has done to man's mind and man's desires. So much of the entertainment in our world is a communication of Satan's ideas, Satan's attitudes, Satan's methods of, of operation. Much of our entertainment world, much of what we see in academia, many of the practices in commerce and economics, many of these things are under the influence of fear, pride, lust, greed idolatry, rebellion, all of the traits that condemn. And that's why Jesus died at the cross, died on the cross. Why did Jesus die? Because God condemned human society. And, and, and he condemned human society because of pride and rebellion. Man decided to separate himself from God and to gain his own independent access to information. And man did that under the influence of Satan. And so that's what we got in Genesis chapter 3, and that's what we discover in Revelation 20. The serpent deceived the world. The serpent deceived mankind, even though Paul says, well, the man, the male was not deceived. In one context, that's true. Essentially, the word of God says that Satan is a liar and a murderer, and he deceives the whole world world. It says that very clearly. He deceives people. All of us have sinned because we thought it was the right thing to do and it wasn't the right thing to do. And so sin essentially is the breaking of God's laws, the rejection of his expectations, the ignoring of his will. If you are around people who ignore God, and you, and, and you intentionally interact with them for prolonged periods of time, it's because you like them, you like that, you don't hold them accountable for the life that Jesus commands men to live. No, you don't hold them accountable. You don't think that they have to submit to the word of God. You don't think that they have to live their life according to the teaching of Jesus, according to the power of Jesus. When Jesus said you must be born again, you don't agree that a person is only a good person, only uh, a person with whom you should interact with for extended periods of time if they're born again. You say to yourself, no. You don't have to be born again for me to interact with you for an extensive period of time. You can be a liar. You can be uh, vain. You can be idle. You can be a part of the problem. You can be a uh, hypocrite. You can be lukewarm. You can love ungodly things. And I'll interact with you for an extensive period of time, even though I profess to love God. You say that you don't really care much about God, or at least your actions say it. Your words might say you love God. Your actions speak different words than your verb, your verbiage, and I profess to love God, I profess to know God, and I don't mind spending extensive time with you even though you are that way. So in that sense, you are validating that person. You are telling that person simply by your willingness to interact for an extensive period of time that 
You agree with their decision making, their perspectives, their lifestyle. Yeah, because that's why you're even interacting with them for this extensive period of time. Not because you want to bring change, not because you believe that you have to lead by example, not because you are going to intentionally work for the person's development. No, but because you just, there's a part of you that ignores God too, that enjoys evil as well. Yeah, yeah, man. I, 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 I like hanging out with people to whatever extent that ignore God, that just talk about life outside of God, that don't necessarily li think in terms of the stuff Jesus says. They don't. They, 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 they don't. They, they, their their thoughts are not governed by the Word of God. They, they, they don't hold themselves accountable for adherence to God's Word. They they don't submit themselves to God. They, they don't make sure they're not. They're not careful to ensure that the things that they say are consistent with the things their their Almighty God commands them to say. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians six fourteen on down says, "Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion what communion has light with darkness, and what concord has Christ with Belial?" That's the name of a spiritual entity that is evil or what part has Christ or what part has he that believes with a person who rejects the faith and God is asking what we call these rhetorical questions he's making a point he wants to understand his standards so when he says what fellowship has light with darkness he's saying there's nothing light there's nothing there's nothing that light has to agree with darkness. He's saying, no, light and darkness don't mix. He is saying that Christ and the devil don't mix. They don't have anything in common. They, they, they don't agree. So how come, why do you agree with this person when this person embodies lust or pride or rebellion? Why do you associate with this? Why do you spend time doing that when the word of God specifically says this is how men ought to, 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 to govern themselves? And then so he says, verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Another, another way of saying that is there is no agreement that the temple of God has with idols. It says for you, talking about the professed believer, talking about humanity, most don't recognize their identity. But the people who are born again are born again into the new identity recognizing that this is what they were supposed to have been from the very beginning. And so repentance is about a transition from ignorance and death to life and light. No, I know that there's a way that I'm supposed to be living. I'm not living that way. I need to go to Jesus so he transforms me and informs me and empowers me to live according to the will of Almighty God the Father. The Father has standards. Man can't meet those standards without the power of the Spirit of God. And so there is no agreement that the temple of God, the people, have, have or has with idols. He says, for you are the temple of the living God, the one who is actually in control. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Wherefore, and look at what verse 17 says. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come you out from among them, come out from among them, and be you separate, says the Lord. The Lord is commanding separation between the people who profess faith and obey it and the people who profess faith and don't obey it. He's saying you cannot. And then with among those who ignore God altogether, he, they, they just don't talk about him. They just don't think about him. They just don't. The word of God says that he is not in all of their thoughts. They are ambivalent 
or indifferent concerning evil. Like they don't they don't really have an opinion concerning righteousness or unrighteousness, concerning truth or error. No, they don't really have a perspective. Like, oh, well, you know. Like, no, no, no. So you do you love righteousness and hate iniquity? Because Jesus loves righteousness and hates iniquity. That's what Hebrews 1 says. It says that he loves righteousness and hates iniquity. The word of God says, all you that love the Lord hate evil. So if we have a very limited and a very, a very limited understanding of evil, then we're going to enjoy it in ways that we are, we are not supposed to. So he says, wherefore, because you are the temple of the living God, he specifically says, come you out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord, and do not touch the unclean thing, that which has curses attached to it, that which has spiritual power on it to bring suffering, that which has spiritual power on it to bring death, that which has spiritual power on it to bring, to, 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 invite evil spirits to bring suffering and death he says he says and i will receive you a part of your salvation is being separate from ungodly influences according to second corinthians 6 verses 17 a part of your salvation is being separated from ungodly influence according to second corinthians 6 verse 17 a part of your salvation a part of your identity as a Christian is being separate from those who reject the Lord unless you are committed to their transformation and you are sent of God to bring transformation. Bringing transformation does not look like becoming like the ones that you've been commanded to separate yourself from. This is the same Paul who said, I become all things to all men that I might by any means win some. Yet by the Holy Ghost, he says clearly that one of the, one of the basis for your salvation is your willingness to separate yourself from those who reject God or ignore God or just live by their own standards, except those who live by their own standards, who live by standards of pride and lust and fear and idolatry. No, do you live according to the love of God, according to the truth of God? Do you agree that everything that the word of God says is true and that you are obligated to surrender yourself to it? Or do you believe that you have the right to, 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 to think what you want, say what you want, do what you want, meet standards that are being set by the culture that's around you. So he says this, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean, do, unclean thing. Do not possess that which men are commanded to despise. And if you don't know the difference, it's because you are too busy wasting your life. If you can't tell the difference between the truth, the stuff that you should be interacting with, and the stuff that you should not be interacting with, it's because you are too busy enjoying the empty, vain world, and you've not positioned yourself to hear. You, you, it's just because you don't want to know. He says, and I will receive you, and will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God, the Lord Almighty. The Lord is saying that a part of your identity as a son of God, a part of your identity as a child of God is the fact that you separate yourself from people, places, and things that do not communicate the righteousness of God. That's a part of your identity. If it affects your ability to obey God's word, if it hinders what Jesus is saying, then he's saying he's and you immerse yourself in it you subject yourself in it to it you support it you agree with it he is saying he is not going to remain your father now we 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 this is not debatable this is this is a a non-debatable reality this is not about whether you agree with this or not this is about what god is actually stating through his very word and if you don't believe the word of God, you are already a slave 
to the devil because essentially you have no basis for reality if you don't if the word of god is not your basis for how life works then you are easily manipulated because you you are manipulated like you, you you've been deceived you, you you are deceived if you don't believe that the word of god as it's written is a, a is a is god's expressed expectation for all mankind you well you're in error anyway so you know you're just waiting to die essentially but in verse 1 of second corinthians 7 so second corinthians 6 verses 14 on down through 18 and then first Corinth and then second corinthians chapter 7 says this in verse 1 having therefore these promises since god is making you some promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god so god commands his people to perfect holiness in the fear of god so we are learning that the churches are losing the fear of god and we are calling it religious to preach and to live by the fear of god that's religious they're just religious see i'm a child of god i hear from god I'm spiritual. God is merciful. I'm receiving his grace. If what if your interaction with God does not bring you into conformity to his word, you have another spirit. You have another false spirit. I'll read that to you very plainly. In 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 5, 1 John 4, 5, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but try them. Try the spirits. How do I try the spirits? Uh, do I speak into the air? Do I ask in my dreams when they manifest if Jesus came in, in, in the flesh? The first spirits that we are trying are the spirits that are in the people we interact with. Not just the voices that enter our minds. Yes, we are testing those spirits and we are holding those spirits accountable to God's word. But there are people with whom we interact and they have beliefs and perspectives that contradict the words of Jesus Christ and the works of Jesus Christ. Their behavior, their words, and their actions are fueled by a spiritual source, good or evil. The Lord says you need to try that. And then in verse 5, he says this, they are of the world. That's why they speak like the world. And the people who are ungodly, governed by lust and pride, they hear them. And then he says, we are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God doesn't listen to us, doesn't have an appetite for the things we say. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's the New Testament. There are many people who reject what Jesus is saying because they want to feel comfortable living a life that God condemns. You can't live a life that God condemns thinking that your ignorance is going to protect you from the consequences. Second, uh, First John two verse, verses five and six. But whoso keeps his word, the things Jesus commands us to do, in him really, verily, is the love of God perfected. This is how we know that we're even in him. First John is one of those passages. Is one of those letters that that confronts this vain perspective of God that allows people to think that they can live by and set their own standards. We live in a world where many people believe themselves or they believe the idol, the empty hearted like them. They, they, they believe vanity. They enjoy vanity. That's not the will of God. It's not the will of God that you be a fake person. It is the will of God that you be a faithful person. Broad is the way and wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Broad is the way and wide is the gate. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and most are going down that path, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. 
John is saying, if people adhere to the teachings that we've set forth, it's evident that the Spirit of God is at work in their lives. If people do not enjoy, don't have a love for the truth as documented in God's word, it's because the spirit of error is controlling their hearts. Very plain. It's a very plain revelation. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this in verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once be named among you as becomes saints. He's saying it's not good for saints to be identified as unclean cup fornicators, covet, greedy. He says this in verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking. A lot of what we hear is foolish talking, nor joking, which isn't convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Verse 5, this is Ephesians 5, 5, and 6. Here, let me read to you Ephesians 5, 5 through 7. Ephesians 5, 5 through 7. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, who nor, nor covetous Man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And he's talking to a church and he tells the church this, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things comes the wrath of God on those who disobey, on children of disobedience. Be you not therefore partakers with them. Verse 8, for you were sometimes darkness. You used to be this. If you're hearing this and you say, man, all have sinned. That's the spirit of error talking through you because, yes, men do things. Christians or people who profess Christ do things that they're not supposed to do. When they identify it, they're supposed to confess it and turn away from it. If it takes them a hundred times to confess it and to turn away from it, they don't justify it. They don't laugh at it. They don't celebrate it. They don't accept it as a way of life or as normal. No, they despise buys it, they recognize it as something that they ought not do, something that they ought not engage with. No, 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 even though I did wrong, there is no excuse for it. If I don't really truly put this down, I know I'm not going to spend forever with God. So I'm not going to make excuses for it. I'm not going to tell you that it's okay. I'm not going to say that we're, you know, no, nobody's perfect. No, I'm not going to hide behind rebellion. He says, for you was sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. And then he says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove or confront them. That's what Jesus is saying by his servant Paul, by the Holy Ghost. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So the word of God is commanding us to separate ourselves from people, places, and things that cause us to disobey God, that cause us to walk away from God's expectations, that justify wrongdoing, that mock at wrongdoing, that tell us that wrongdoing isn't wrong, but rather that right speaking is wrong speech. Jesus is returning, and when he comes, he is going to find a world that is full of liars. But is he also going to find faith? That's a question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? You have to ask yourself, where am I going to be? Who am I going to be when Jesus manifests? Whether I die and go to him, or whether he manifests. When I die, or when he comes... Who am I going to be? Who you support, who you submit to, what you expose yourself to, what you commit to, that identifies you. If you love Jesus, you will do what Jesus tells you to do. Jesus says that people who love him, who follow him, who, are, who abide in him, who hear his voice, they don't recognize the voice of strangers. They don't accept foreign information. They don't embrace that which produces anger and lust and pride and fear and, and vanity. No, no, no. That's not what they set their minds on. People of God set their minds on God. People who reject God set their minds on things that have nothing to do with the righteousness of God. Evaluate where you stand. This is David Williams with Jesus Ministries.